<laughs> My A doesn't work today. A, Q, Z. <laughs> All right, so much for that. So let's continue talking about path integrals real quick. Um, and then we'll move on to line integrals. But remember that a path integral looks like this. It's a single integral over a curve C. And then we have a function. And then, uh, oh, should we try to go with what the book does? They use S. So we'll stick with R. <laughs> mm. Yeah, which is really the result. I think it's later on we're going to have a capital S. I thought we already did. No, we're going to come back to it. We're going to do more capital S. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're going to have this thing called surface integral. Uh, anyways, um, the idea is that we have this curve, and we're integrating uh, a function over this curve. And we had one geometric interpretation of that, where it's like uh, a curve on the xy plane gets projected up on the, on the surface. And then we found the area. Um, of a fence whose base is that curve and then whose height is uh, up on that surface. And we need to parameterize C. And R of T is, is expected to have an X of T, Y of T. from A to B. And once you have this information, then you can go ahead and, and go from your path integral to a working definition where you actually have an integral to compute. So F is a function of X and Y. And so it would be natural to put in the X of T, Y of T. And in that sense, it now becomes a function of t. And so we're going to have a dt here, but we're integrating over the arc length. And so we need the arc length component. So the dr has that arc length component. Now we can write it all out with the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared. Or we can just say it's a magnitude of r prime squared, which is to take the derivative of this and then find the magnitude. And then now you're dt. So in general, the dr element, the dr differential, becomes this r prime, the magnitude of r prime of t. Okay. Now let's examine this from a couple of different points of views and find some other, uncover some other uh, applications of this. So, uh, we can figure out a mass of some curve. So say you had a wire and you bent your wire in certain ways or you're creating a wire uh, and you dipped it in something in, in metal to create the wire. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just making it up now. And, and so, uh, and so it, it, it followed a certain function that described the density depending on the X and Y 
component of this thing. So, so let this be uh, and then densities in grams or something like that per uh, meter, and we'll do, I guess, kilograms per meter, and we'll do it so that it's it's looking at a length. So uh, we have this function is a density of a curve C. And the C, again, is something that we would parameterize. Then the mass is given by Can't undo, no arrow. It's given by a path integral, so it's essentially uh, the integral of that density over the curve. Okay, so the example that we did yesterday, where we had x times y over some curve that they defined, we could have let x times y to be your density function, and then and then it would work out. So that's one application. I won't do an example of that. Uh, but now let's take a look at another one. Uh, so we've had this thing where we had, we were studying the, the double and triple integrals, and then what what we did was we took a look at what happened if the integrand was 1. And so here, since we're dealing with scalar functions, 1 is definitely a candidate for a scalar function. What happens if you put 1 in here? What do you, what do you get? Anybody know? Yeah? The length of the curve, right? So if you would follow this through with the definition, the definition that we have up here, you just have 1, a to b, and then the dr becomes the magnitude of r prime of t dt. And then if you really dig into that and uncover that, uh, this is x prime of t squared. Oops, this is a prime, this is a squared. I can't undo. Something's wrong with my computer. And so this is just the arc length. of the curve C provided that you parameterized it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so it doesn't change. So that's, that's this part over here. But, you know, sometimes you might actually have a function in there. So you would need to multiply it. But in this case, where the integrand is 1, all you have is this, which is the arc length. And this is the arc length formula, if you remember. If you don't, this is the arc length formula. OK? All right, so furthermore, we don't need to just stick with this thing in two dimensions on the xy plane, because we know that we can draw curves in 3D also, right? So another extension of this would be if we bring it up to three dimensions, say we had a wire, so get a wire hanger and then make a, a shape out of it. Now you have a curve in three dimensions. And then if you have a density function for that wire, 
the density function could be f of x, y, and z. So now you have three variables here. And just as easily as we did this path integral in two dimensions, we can also do it in three dimensions because now your curve is in 3D, which means your curve will have a parametric representation in 3D. And all that's really saying is that you have three components, x, y, z, all functions of t. So just think of the helix as uh, your, your basic example, that spring. That's a curve in three dimensions. And so your path integral would look like, oh, yeah, I can't. Your path integral would just be dropping all this information into the function. And the only difference is now this time you've got three slots to fill in. But there, in the end, it's all still going to be a function of t. And then this r prime of t magnitude will just have a third component. You've got the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared now. And then dt. And so that's how you would work this out. Okay. So just as easily as we're able to do this in two dimensions, we can do it in three dimensions. And we're just adding another component to your f. It's still going to be a single variable, a, fun it's a, a single integral, an integral of t. And you're still going to go from a to b depending on what a and b are, your starting and your ending points. OK? So this is your path integral in 3D. All right. I think we're ready to move into our new integral. Let's uh, take a look at a line integral. My <laughs> now my my E's don't work. There we go. Line. <laughs> All right. So remember that the book calls what we're calling path integral, the book also calls that a line integral. They call everything a line integral. But like I said, I want to make this differentiation because I, th I think personally that these two integrals are actually different. Now, when we begin to set it up, you might see some similarities and that would make sense. But I, I still want to call it something different. So and we'll have some summary pages as we develop more integrals. So a line integral. Uh, we just learned yesterday about this new thing, new function called a vector field. So it would be interesting to be able to, to integrate a vector field. But integrating a vector field is kind of weird. So let me start off with, um, with saying a vector field. Uh, let capital F. And we'll go with a two-dimensional vector field for now, and then we can easily extend that to three dimensions by adding your third um, your third component. So let F be a vector field. I've never <laughs> I've never abbreviated vector field as VF before, but I think I'm going to start now. 
vector field. So uh, suppose you have a vector field, and then we'll let um, let R of T parameterize. So these are the, the two components that you need. You need a function, a vector field to put inside of the integral, and you need a curve that you're going to integrate over. And so the line integral I'm doing this writing stuff because I didn't prepare for my class. I don't have my notes. I mean, I I had notes that I just kind of took pictures from the book, but that's kind of cheesy. Uh, whatever. You guys can read my writing now, so it's okay. Uh, the line integral is given by... Now, this is still going to be a single integral. We're going to integrate over C. Uh, and this time, we're going to integrate a vector field. Now, there's something uh, something about the vector. The vector field has two components in it. And it's not like a vector-valued function where we just integrate the component, component by component, because each component has uh, two variables. So you got f of x, y, f1 of x, y, f2 of x, y. And so it gets a little bit more complicated. But in any case, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to dot it. Uh, this dot here is not just a multiplication. It's actually a dot product. And notice that when I write the differential dr, it actually has an arrow on top. So it's actually looking at a vector. And we'll take a look at each of these components uh, when we write the working definition. But for now, we have a bold face dotted with D and a bold face, uh, whether that bold face is G here or, or S or whatever, it's, it's a vector. So it actually is a dot product. Okay, now what's going to happen here is for us to actually work it out, uh, we're going to rely on the parameterization of C, which is uh, R of T from A to B, and so the A to B will B are limits. And then in your F vector field, you're going to put in your, your X of T and Y of T. So the X vector field, remember, these have components. And so this is still uh, the first stages of working this out. Uh, but this will get, give you a vector. And now we're going to expect a vector out of the dr. And the dr without the arrow is the magnitude of the derivative. The dr with the arrow is just the derivative without the magnitude. So the magnitude makes it a scalar. Without the magnitude keeps it a vector. And so now this would make sense as something that we can take the dot product of. And then we have a dt. So essentially, your dr over here, the dr where r is a vector, is going to get replaced with the derivative. Now, what's all this mean? Let's uh, let's let's get the idea of the meaning of this first, and then we'll we'll do an example. So what that means is that let's start off with a vector field, and let's let's pick a simple vector field like uh, like just a vector field that just goes out. So that's like um, x comma y or something, just goes out. And now let's let's have a curve. Well, 
We'll have a starting and ending point for the curve. Uh, oh, one thing I didn't talk about the path integral is that for the path integral, um, when when you when you make when you parameterize a curve, you you go from one point to another point. And so when you parameterize a curve, it has a specific orientation. When you're doing a path integral, it, it's really not going to matter which way your orientation is going. However, when you're doing a line integral, it will make a difference which way your orientation is going. So let's keep that idea in mind. Maybe we'll make a little note here that says orientation is important. The orientation of C and how you parameterize it is important. And so when they give you a C in this line integral, they would tell you which way it's going from where to where. Okay? Now, what are we actually finding here is, is the question. Um, so what we're going to do, why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, say this is T is equal to A, that's the starting point. T is equal to B is the ending point. And let's pick some random point we're going to pick a couple of random points. Let's pick one over here and one over here. Doesn't matter where they are. So what you're doing in your integral is you're essentially doing something and then you're adding it up a, an infinite number of times, right? So that's the general story behind the integral. Riemann sum and becomes an integral infinite number of times. So what are, you, what are you adding up an infinite number of times? Well, if we fix ourselves a point here, what we're doing is we're computing a dot product of the vector field evaluated at that point and the tangent, uh, the vector tangent to the curve at that point. So let me draw the vector tangent to the curve first. Maybe I should have done that in a different color. So this is your r prime of t somewhere. We can put t sub t sub 1 or something, some, some t value on your curve. Now, x of t1, y of t1 gives you this position, gives you this red dot. And then the vector field itself from that dot would be going in whatever direction it's going. So you're essentially taking the dot product of that. I don't know if it looks 90 degrees, but it doesn't have to be. It wasn't meant to be 90 degrees, just some angle. Now, one of the things that we kind of did with the dot product, I didn't do it really in detail, but one of the, one of the physical computations that you get from a dot product is work done if you have a force times a distance or a force times a direction. So if you dot the force with the direction that you're moving, you're actually finding the work being done. And so that's what we're going to lead to. Uh, let's do this other one. So we can do a whole bunch of these things. Again, it doesn't didn't mean to be perpendicular here, even if it looked perpendicular. Maybe we'll just do one more for good measure. So you're essentially taking dot products of the direction, the, the tangent vectors along the curve with the vector field itself at those points. 
So physically, what you can think about this is that the line integral will help you, one application of this, So the line integral finds the work done, computes the work done along a curve C. I don't know if with respect to is the correct phrase. Um, Work done along a curve C through, let's put through, a vector field F. So we can think about the vector field as a force field, as a gravitational field, or as an electric field. So you can think about a current going through a wire and then we can look, imagine what the work done going through that current for going through that wire if you have an electrical field um, that's acting on it okay so this is generally the application that's used for figuring out line integrals All right, so now let's let's see if we could do an example to to try to make sense out of this. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but you get a numerical value, you get the, the, the you get a positive value if it's acute, right? And then you get a negative value if it if it's obtuse. Okay. So if the angle is bigger than 90 degrees, you get negative values, and so that would also have an effect on the orientation of the curve if you're going one way versus another. Now here's one here, but let's see if we got. No, I don't want to do the last one. It wasn't the last one. Well, I don't ever want to do a last one. Or something that you have trouble with. <laughs> it's too hard. It's weird because it's, it's a situation where, where the curve is the where the position on the curve is dependent on the gradient. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get there. Uh, let's do this one. This looks like something that's easy to do. Oh, uh, this is already three dimensions. Is it okay if we jump to three dimensions? We can think about this as in three dimensions as well. We have a gravitational field or something like that, and then you're you're walking along some path, and then you're all right. Let's do number five and jump into three dimensions. So remember that the vector field has three components. It has three functions that's put into the x, y, and z slots. And then if you're doing this in three dimensions, then you should expect to have a curve in three dimensions as well. So we want our working definition handy for your integral, your line integral. And what we want to do is we essentially want to put your x of t, y of t, z of t into the functions, and these are your x of t, y of t, z of t's. And then you're going to dot it with just the derivative of the curve. 
So we need a couple of things. We need uh, f of x, y, z. Oh, am I going to rewrite that over? x of t, y of t, z of t. Oh, boy. I'm getting sloppy. All right. So the first component, I'm going to... I'm going to switch from i, j, k to the, the bracket notation. And so in the first component, I have x plus y. So x is t squared, y is t cubed. So that's the first component in i. And the j is y minus z. So y is t cubed, and z is t squared. And then the last one is z cubed, and so that's t squared to the third power. So that's uh, the first part of my line integral. The second part of my line integral would be the derivative of r. And again, I'm going to switch over to the bracket notation. A derivative of two, uh, t, uh, t squared is 2t. The derivative of that is 3t squared, and the derivative is 2t again. Okay? So now I want the dot product, like f dot r prime. So, kind of see the dot product over here. Uh, I'm going to write it out first, and then I'll simplify it uh, later, just so it'll be clear. Remember, when you take the dot product, it becomes a scalar, so you're going to lose the commas, lose the i, j, k's, if that's what you're going to stick with. I got 3t squared, and then t cubed minus t squared, and then plus 2t, and then let's call this t to the sixth. Is that right? You multiply, right? To the sixth. And so, <clears throat> before we even integrate, we tend to simplify these things a little bit. Uh, just so we can get a feel and maybe have an easier integral. 2t to the third plus 2t to the fourth plus 3t to the fifth minus 3t to the fourth plus 2t to the seventh. And so let me just rearrange anything that I can put together and then put the big one first. 2t to the seventh plus 3t to the fifth minus t to the fourth and those two and then 2t to the third. So it looks like I was only able to combine a couple of things. But anyways, this is your integrand. So that your line integral, your integral of f dot dr over the curve c is going to equal to a simple, I think it's simple, uh, single integral. We're going to go integrate from 0 to 1. That's our set of limits that are given here. Uh, we're going to put this inside. 2t to the 7th plus 3t to the 5th minus t to the 4th plus 2t cubed dt. And, you know, you can finish this. That would be it. Yeah. This one? So this one came from F. This used to be green. This used to be X plus Y, but X is equal to T squared and Y is equal to T cubed. And then, so that's the first component here. And then now you do the same thing for the second and third components. Okay. Any questions? All right. You guys are now line integral experts. <laughs> okay.
Yes. Joe. Yeah. Um, And this is your these are your X of T's. Any other questions? So it kind of just becomes a plug and chug thing, which is nice, I guess. <coughs> no, it's in the next one. Uh, gradient field. I, I think I think it's the next one. Where it doesn't give you a position function, it gives you a velocity function. And you have to find the position. Or no, it gives you an initial position, but it doesn't give and the and the velocity uh, the velocity field is entirely in terms of positions. Hmm. All right, let's do this one. Let's try. So another thing that you guys are going to have to do is you guys are going to have to be able to parameterize things. Now, we did a little bit of parameterization, parameterizing back in Chapter 10. But you're going to need to be able to go back and parameterize lines and circles at least and then try to parameterize other things as well. So let's do this problem. It says find the work done by the force field in moving an object from P to Q. And let's imagine this object moving from P to Q goes from P to Q in a straight line. And um, so let's, let's, let's try this out and then uh, let's dig into this, this problem in detail. And then um, Oh. Mm. I, I'd have to take a look at the problem. You, you had to find the end point. Oh. Hmm. What was I doing? Oh, we're going to do a line. Um, so let's imagine our curve C is going to be a line. So let's say we're going to do a line integral where C is going to be a line from P, which is 0, 4, to Q, which is 8, 0. And uh, so you're going to have to go back and try to remember, oh, okay, if I have a, a point P, 0, 4, and Q, 8, 0, and I want a line connecting these two things. And I want a, a line. The line has to be in a specific direction. 
So we have to say that we're starting from P and going to Q. Because if you do it the other way, actually we'll try to do it the other way as well and we'll see what happens. And then I think I might need Wolfram Alpha to help me compute this integral. So. So let's find R of T. And if you remember lines, we have starting and ending points. Do um, you remember how to parameterize this? We're going to start with a starting point, 0, 4, plus t times a direction. Now, the direction that we're going to create is, is we're going to pretend that this whole thing is one whole vector. And so that vector is going to be head minus tail. So we're going to have 8, 0, minus 0, 4. And then if we work this out, fix it all up, we're going to get our, um, our parameterization. So your parameterization is going to be the x components is going to be 0 plus t times 8 minus 0 is 8. And then you have 4 plus t times, and then you have 0 minus 4. So that, I guess that's a minus 4. Okay, work it out. Hopefully it's correct. Yep. So, because it's linear, the derivative is just the direction. So it's going to be 8, negative 4. Okay. So we got R and R prime. We have the function, though we have the vector field. We're going to put uh, f into the vector field, so f evaluated at x and y, where x is equal to 8t, and then y is equal to 4 minus 4t. That's going to be e to the negative. 4 minus 4t, comma, uh, x, what's x? x is 8t, e to the negative 4 minus 4t. I don't know. Minus, yeah. Yeah? All right, let's dot them. So I'll call it FDR, F dot DR, and then we'll just make sure we throw the DT in there. So it's really this vector field dotted with the derivative of the of the function okay so let's dot them it looks like these things are just going to pick up some constants so this will equal to uh, 8 e to the minus 4 minus 4t, and then negative, negative is a positive, 32, there's a t in there, e to the negative, 4 minus 4t, dt. So that's what you want to integrate. By the way, this is, uh, you can draw this 
line from 0 to 1. I forgot to put the limits here. So that's, that, that's what's going to end up being your limits. All right. So finally, your integral is going to be an integral from 0 to 1 of this thing that we just wrote, 8e to the negative 4 minus 4t plus 32t e to the negative 4 minus 4t dt. Yeah? Yeah, we can. Uh, and then we can probably use integration by parts. Yeah. But I'm not going to do that because I'm just going to use Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> so let's integrate, uh, what is it, 8. Let's factor it out like you said. So it'll be uh, 8 plus 32t and then times e raised to the negative 4. Can I just put 4t minus 4? It's the same, right? Just switch the signs. Okay. And then we're going to let t equal to 0 and then go all the way up to 1. Eight? The answer is eight? Okay, answer is eight. Let's check our answer. Enter a number. It turns out that this vector field is is uh, kind of special. What what um uh, if you look at this problem, it kind of didn't specify that the curve from point. P to point Q is a straight line. So technically, we could have gotten there via another curve, uh, like maybe a parabola or something. By the way, if you go the other way, you'll, you'll, you'll get the negative of the answer. Um, can you just convince yourself of that? <laughs> so I don't have to talk much about it. So that's when the orientation is important because you go from point P to point Q. If you went the other way, then um, your derivative would have been going the opposite way. You would have gotten a negative of your answer. <clears throat> so anyways, what I wanted to try to do is, I don't know how easy this is going to be, but I wanted to try to do that same problem, but instead of a straight line, try to use a, a different curve, like maybe a parabola. So we'll need to see if we can come up with a parabola or something. Well, it has to go from uh, 0, 4 to 8, 0 again. So let's, let's put our heads together here to see if you guys can come up with an equation. of an upside down parabola that intersects at 8. It has a y intercept of 4. What do you think? x minus 8 squared. What? a squared? So I'm thinking just an upside down parabola, so negative x that's moved up 4 units. And and uh, and so I need to make it wider. 
So what do we multiply by? I think we multiply the x by by what? Eight. What? Eight? What? One eighth. One half. So set this equal to zero. That's that's you let the y equal to zero. You'll find your x-intercepts, right? So this should be 116? <laughs> Shouldn't be too hard. Right? We're a bunch of math people in here. Oh, it hit 8. Yep, it hit an 8. So one sixteenth would work. Thanks. We good? <clears throat> so if you just let x equal to t, then you'll have a parameterized curve. So let r of t equal to, uh, if you let x equal to t, and then you let your y value equal to whatever your y value is, Then your graph is going to draw this from from zero to whatever the x value, wherever you want to stop. And so in this case, we want to go all the way up to eight. In fact, we can double check. Oops, that's not what I wanted. To four. I don't know. So let me uh, this would be T and four minus one sixteenth T squared. If I go from zero to one, I stop there. If I go from zero to four, I don't quite make it. So if I go from zero to eight then that, that's the piece of the curve that I'm drawing. Okay? All right. So we've successfully parameterized another path that's not a straight line going from uh, 0, 4 to 8, 0. So this is our path now. Now let's see if we can run through the same thing. Uh-oh. I'm going to have a squared and an e power. Oh. This is not going to be good. All right, so let's let's find r prime of t because we'll eventually need that. Uh, we got negative eight t. Is that right? Uh, zero, one sixteenth times two. Oh, that's one eighth. One eighth t. <laughs> is that good? All right. So uh, we take our f, and then we put in the r function, the x of t, y of t, z of t, or in this case, x of t, y of t. So this is e to the, yeah, that thing, 4 minus 1 16th t squared. That's the first component. And then you have an x, which is t times a negative x, which is t, times e to the negative y, which is, again, it's 4 minus 1 16th t squared. Uh, 
and then we dot them so we're gonna come up with a sum this would be e to the negative 4 minus 1 16th t squared plus and we have uh, negative and negative is a positive uh, 1 eighth t times t so that's 1 eighth t squared and then this thing again so we could do the same thing and factor out and now your integral is going to be from 0 to 8 remember 8 and then 1 plus 1 eighth t squared e to the negative 4 minus 1 16th t squared dt all right yeah that's going to be easy so I think I have the old integral here so let me just change a couple of things I have 1 plus 1 eighth times t squared. Got to get my order of operations correct here. I think it's okay, but let me just put a parentheses around the 1 eighth t squared. And then the exponent now has changed to uh, negative parentheses 4 minus. 1 16th times t squared and then I'm integrating from 0 to 8 so hopefully whatever I get here I should get uh, the same number as I got last time 8 Parentheses. You guys know about coding. Leave out a parentheses or semicolon. There we go. Eight. <clears throat> All right. So uh, in this particular scenario, it's actually not a coincidence that you got eight. That we got eight. Because like I said, there's something special about this vector field. So it turns out that it doesn't matter what path we take to go from point A to point B. Uh, and that it's called path independent. So let's take a look at what path independent means. So it turns out that if you integrate a line integral over one curve and then you integrate the same line integral over a different curve where C1 and C2 are different except for the endpoints. Then F is path independent. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So it turns out that F is path independent and F is conservative. Wait, F is conservative. 
When is F conservative? So if F is path independent, it turns out that it's conservative. There's, this is not any way a proof of, of this theorem. There's, the proof is a lot more complicated. I'm just stating that if F is path independent, then it's, con it's, then it's conservative. And if it's conservative, that means it's a gradient field. And if it's a gradient field, then it's equal to uh, the gradient of some, what's that function called again? Potential, potential function. And F is a potential function. And it turns out that that potential function plays a key in finding our integral. Should we do it or are we done? <laughs> All right, next time. Potential function and how it plays into this path independence. And then we're going to come to this big theorem called the Fundamental Theorem of Line Integrals, which is our first FTOC, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus.